and a discussion and a discussion to go along with that. The following week, um, as you've seen me email and we'll, we'll have other announcements about, is um, Lauren Gilchrist, the Vice President of Planned Parenthood, will be coming back to speak about the, the landscape of reproductive, um, primarily reproductive abortion rights in Minnesota and how it may be changing or may not be changing with regards to the other states. Um, in the last email that I sent about it, I also sent a link for you to post any anonymous questions, post any questions that you might have, and those would be anonymous. Um, I'm meeting with Lauren in the coming weeks to, to um, shape this seminar, and she's asked that we ask her some questions prior to, and that's exactly what this site is intended to do, is, is to get some of those questions um, out, so um, to get us all thinking about what the most important topics to us are on this topic, um, and to have a really lively discussion once she gets here in two weeks. Um, I will be dropping the um, site for, for questions for Lauren's seminar in the chat during the seminar, as well as um, to other um, sites, the one for the full seminar schedule for this fall, as well as the site where you can watch um, old seminars. So with that, let's have some fun. Um, today is um, a lot of fun because these are individuals who have been uh, who have either received a training grant themselves or been a part of um, someone else receiving a training grant. And these are all very important players to the process and we're really happy and glad to have them all here. We've, um, I should say, this has been organized by the research committee within the division. If you don't know, the research committee has been um, meeting regularly to set up, set up systematic ways in which we can conduct research here in the division in, in efficient ways um, and far reaching ways. And Nancy Sherwood, um, we, we owe her a lot because she's been chairing this committee. Um, and so this, this in-service is a, is a part of, um, of their work. So the committee has chosen um, individuals that have, uh, that have obtained training grants at different levels. Um, at the pre-doctoral level, today we have Ms. Katie Berry, who is one of our PhD doctoral students. Welcome, Katie. And along with her is um, Professor Rachel Widom, who is her advisor, but was also the, the mentor on her, um, on her winning training grant. We also have Melissa Simone, who is a po Dr. Melissa Simone, who is a postdoc, and she's been working with um, Di Dr. Diane Newmark Schneider, um, and she has been awarded a K99 R00. And then, last but not least, we have um, Professor, one of our newest um, faculty hires, Professor. Horacio Duarte, um, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist and who has received, um, newly received a K award. And we are so grateful that he um, has joined our faculty. And then the last speaker will be Shar Flip, who is the envy of the rest of the school. Whenever we speak to other divisions about their pre-grants process, they always mention um, how great our pre-awards folks are. And that is headed up by Shar. And she's been here uh, long enough, so she knows every trick, she knows every deadline, and she knows every detail of these grants going in. So we love Shar, and we are so glad that she can speak with us today. So without further ado, Nancy, take it over. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks. Thanks, Ruby. And thanks uh, to our panelists for um, uh, being here today and to everybody. I, I feel like we have really good attendance. So Ruby was making um, fun of my email that I sent yesterday, but I would say like, if you need to have a, to send a hype email, you can, you can ask me and I'll try to help you out. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I just have, um, whoopsie, there we go. Can you see that title slide and not like the presenter view? Okay, good. Um, so this, I just have a couple of slides just to kind of give um, a little bit of an intro to what the, some of the basics of what these awards that we're going to be talking about today are, and we'll also be able to, um, we'll share these slides with you just so you have that information. Um, so, um, whoops. 
Okay, there. So we're gonna, as Ruby was um, talking about the different um, people who received the different awards, we're gonna be talking about the F31 um, Gades Award, which is a, for pre-doctoral fellows. Um, and again, I'm not gonna, these are more informational. We're also um, gonna be, oh, wait, the next slide is just to highlight too, that we're not gonna be specifically talking about this today, but for the F31, there's a specific um, uh, program announcement that's for the F31, but for enhancing um, diversity. Um, so that's just something that I want, we wanted to make sure um, people were aware of. Um, and then we're going to talk about the K99 ROO, which is kind of a unique sort of combination of both the training component and um, uh, the ROO part, which um, Melissa Simone's going to be talking about. Um, and then finally, there's the um, K01. So Horacio is going to be um, talking about his path to receiving his um, K01 Mentored Research Scientist Career Development Award. What I most, this is my last slide and then we'll get started with the panel. Um, but what I most wanted to emphasize and, and our panelists will be talking about these components is that these awards, they're career development awards. So there is, as you can see in point three, there is like a, a research um, component of them that's described and that is part of um, how these grants are evaluated. But um, the almost, more and more important not and it's hard to completely weight them but very important is that in when you're writing these awards and they're being reviewed um, there's a lot of focus on um, the fellowship applicant themselves and sort of their promise as a, a research researcher um, there's also a component of evaluating the team surrounding the trainee or the the fellowship applicants. So the spot, like there's different language that's used for the different awards, but basically the mentorship team is also um, a, a focus of evaluating the application. Um, and then also there's a big part of these grants that they're training awards, they're um, career development awards. And so there's a very, um, a lot of thought needs to go into preparing um, those career, that training plan that is accompanying the research. And we'll be hearing um, a lot about that from our applicants, as well as um, the last component is the institutional environment and commitment to training. Um, so with, I'm gonna stop sharing um, and just get to my notes. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, um, each of the panelists, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of read a, some questions that they're going to re respond to. So each panelist is going to sort of have their turn to tell us their story. Um, and then we're going to have Shar talk to us about tips and tricks um, for these awards. And then what we, how, how we've structured it is that we're going to have time for um, questions from, um, from uh, folks who are on uh, the, the seminar here. And one of the things that I've noticed too, just as I'm looking around, is that there are people in the audience who I know have expertise. So um, I, I want people to feel free to share their thoughts um, who've been part of these awards as well. Um, so to start us off, we are going to first hear um, about the F31. Um, so um, Katie and Rachel are gonna are gonna talk about this. Katie's gonna kick us off. So we're we're gonna learn about what mechanisms obviously the um, applicant applied for, the general focus of their grant. How did they just decide to apply? You know, what were the factors that went into the decision? The timing? How do you figure all that out? How did they put together their mentoring team? How did they do that training plan component of their application? Um, and, um, and what, you know, what actually happened? Um, we know that these, these stories have a very happy ending. They all did, all, I'm surprised, like uh, taking the punchline, they all did get the awards, but hearing a little bit about how that went. Um, and, and then again, as when Katie talks, um, uh, Rachel will also talk about it from the mentor perspective. So I will stop talking now and Katie, um, uh, you're up. Sounds great. 
Thanks so much for the introduction, Ruby and Nancy. I really appreciate you guys coordinating this discussion. I'm excited about it. Um, so I applied for an F31, which as a reminder is an individual pre-doctoral fellowship that really focuses on training. So my F31 award is going to support my dissertation research, which looks at the mental health impact of policies that affect individuals with criminal records and spillover effects on their families. But beyond just the research, the F31 is going to give me the flexibility to pursue additional training that sort of goes above and beyond what is typically covered in an epidemiology PhD program. So specifically, my training plan includes coursework and mentoring on policy evaluation, criminology, and mental health, along with additional guidance on things like communicating findings and writing grants. So the whole idea, as Nancy said, of an F31 is to support the training and career development of PhD students as they finish their doctoral work. So both my dissertation research and the training plan that I came up with with my mentors support my career goal of becoming an independent researcher with expertise in conducting rigorous evaluations of the impact of social policies on child and family health. Uh, so it's like really important to tie that all together in a way that like shows that you're you're supporting your your career goal. Um, so how I decided to apply for this mechanism, um, I know that I am interested in pursuing a career in academia, and so grant writing is going to be a huge part of my future. So my primary motivation in applying for the F31 was to develop my grant writing skills uh, in general, and then also specifically to gain exposure to the NIH grant process. Um, but there are a bunch of other things that, of course, factored into my decision as well, uh, including, you know, you have to think about, uh, I had to think about whether I had a solid idea for a project early enough uh, to pursue this kind of an option. Um, I had to really consider whether I was a competitive applicant, um, whether I could make the case that I would benefit from additional training and mentorship beyond what I was getting through the epidemiology PhD program. And then finally, I really had to think about how the application timeline would fit, uh, fit in with my own PhD timeline. And I think that last point is super important. It takes a long time to prepare an application, you know, like six months or so a couple months for it to get reviewed. Um, and it's really important to plan for a resubmission. So the whole process is really time consuming, which makes it really challenging to fit an F31 application into a program where the average time to graduation is four to five years. So it's super important to like think ahead about your goals and start planning for, for these sort of um, things early if you're interested in pursuing this kind of an opportunity. But again, I just wanna reiterate that um, those like logistic concerns certainly factored into my decision, but my primary motivation was the grant writing experience rather than like the outcome of the grant or the, the potential funding that would come with it. Like I was really interested in developing those skills. Um, yeah, Rachel, do you have anything to add about deciding whether an F31 is a good fit for students? Yeah, no, I'm I'm laughing um, because Katie and I were chatting about this a few days ago and about how I was initially um, sort of actually discouraging <laughs> of her applying for one of these um, because uh, you know first of all you know you Katie already had um, was on a T32 and had funding and second of all I you know I really am reluctant of with having especially students go down a road that requires a lot of work that's a real long shot. And I, I had been worried, you know, when I considered F31s for prior students, I had been worried that the fact that we didn't have a track record of F31s would um, be would just weigh down the application in a way that that wouldn't be fair. So as far as I know, we have not had an F31 um, in this division. And I certainly haven't had a student that's an F31. So to go in as a sponsor that, that didn't have, um, you know, a track record of getting F31s that, you know, I, I, I know you got to start somewhere, but I, I didn't necessarily want um, Katie to go through all this work for that kind of long shot. But the thing that sort of, there were two things that sort of convinced me that, that this could be a good idea. 
One was when we decided to have Rob Warren and sociology be a co-sponsor. And now he hasn't had an F31 either, but he um, is the PI of a T32 and has a, a really strong training record. And we both have strong training records at NICHD, which was the institute that, that um, Katie would be applying for. So once I felt better about the sponsor situation, I was feeling a little bit more positive. And the other thing that, that really pushed me over the edge is that Katie, and I'm not saying this is the way you have to be, and certainly not all students are like this, but Katie's always been very clear that her career goal was to be, you know, an independently funded NIH researcher. And having been on a bunch of search committees for faculty positions in the past few years, I know that sort of establishing a record of applying for grants and getting grants um, early on really helps make people very competitive for these positions. So, you know, after thinking about it a little bit more, realizing that, that we could put together a good sponsor team and that this was just really aligned with Katie's own personal goals, then I was, then I, then I came around and I, I thought, yeah, I think this could, this could be a good idea. Thanks, Rachel. I, I'm really glad that you, you brought up Rob, like bringing on Rob as a co-sponsor, because I, I think that that putting together a solid mentoring team is one of the most important parts of developing a competitive application. And I've been really lucky to receive excellent mentorship since I started the PhD, from, both from Rachel, uh, who's my epi advisor, and from Rob Warren, who was my social science mentor on uh, the Population Health Science T32 at the Minnesota Population Center, as Rachel said. So it was kind of an easy decision for me um, to pick the two of them um, as my sponsor and co-sponsor so that I could continue, um, continue to learn from them. Um, and then I also think for a training grant, I, it, it's really important to strike a balance uh, between uh, mentors that you've worked with previously and new additions to your mentoring team. Um, so I added new collaborators to help cover the, the sort of new areas of my training, specifically mental health and criminology. And so the, after that, you know, after I'd formed sort of my core team, um, the, the sponsors, co-sponsors and collaborators that I decided to work with sort of covered all of the methodological and content expertise that I would need to execute my research, but none of them had worked with the survey data or the policy data that I plan to use for my dissertation. So I also added a couple of consultants from outside institutions that had that experience working with that data to sort of uh, fill that perceived gap. Um, so the other thing I also just wanna note about uh, the team aspect is the sort of less form, who's not formally on your team. And that's like the grant people that you work with, who I very much consider as part of my team, um, but were not actually, you know, written into the application. Um, so because I was on the T32 program at the MPC, I, I worked with the, and because I was, Rob was one of my sponsors and most of the collaborators I was working with are MPC affiliated researchers. Um, I support submitted my grant through the MPC and receive an immense amount of support um, from, from their grant. Uh, team, which was really, really important in, in my application. And I know that uh, had I decided to submit through EPI, I would have received like the same or uh, also an exceptional amount of, of support from Char and her team. Um, so Rachel, any tips on uh, forming a team from mentor perspective? Um, so uh, yeah, I think, you know, Shar Shar's going to laugh when I say this because she's going to say Rachel Woodham doesn't do anything early. But one thing I do do early <laughs> is I reach out to people early. And I think this is actually something that's that's really critical. And I think that when you're junior, it can feel daunting to reach out to people and say, you know, like, Mike, would you be interested in this? Could you be a collaborator? But um, that's something that I think is really critical in doing early because some of the people that you have on your team are gonna tell you stuff that is like, like really important for what you're doing as far as formulating your research panel plan. They'll say, did you know you can't do this or this doesn't exist or this does exist. And also just people are, are hard to get in touch with and stuff. So I really recommend um, you know, thinking about people and reaching out to people early, even before you really get into the writing. 
Thanks. Um, so I think in addition to the team, I think developing a rigorous training plan is also an essential part of, of a competitive application. So before I really started working on writing my application, I tried to gather as many examples as possible. Um, I searched NIH reporter for recently funded F31s in similar research areas, and I cannot recommend doing this enough. Uh, I cold emailed uh, five or six individuals. Uh, I, I, I think it was six. I cold emailed six individuals with recent awards, and six out of six of them sent me their complete applications and some helpful tips. Uh, so people are incredibly kind and supportive, and I highly recommend doing that. Uh, looking at these examples really helped me understand the universe of what is possible for, for training activities. Uh, and I also, um, so that was like really, really the most helpful thing that I did. Um, I also found it helpful to start uh, by thinking about my long-term career goal and working backwards to try to come up with short-term goals that would help me get there. Uh, so then I met with Rachel and Rob, my sponsor and co-sponsor, to refine those short-term goals. And we organized them into content expertise goals, research methodology goals, research dissemination goals, and career preparation goals. Uh, and once we had finalized this list of goals, it was a lot easier to come up with activities to uh, slot into each goal and support uh, each one of those goals. Um, another tip I think um, is I tried really hard to link my goals and training activities uh, to my research strategy and to the expertise of specific mentors. And I think in general grantsmanship strategy, like integration and like strategic repeti repetition are really, really important uh, and particularly for this type of award. Um, so, um, I thought it also might be helpful for me to say a little bit more about the timing of my application. So as a second year PhD student, I started working on the research side of my application in Nancy's grant writing uh, class, which is amazing, uh, during the fall of 2020. And that semester, I also focused on sort of the planning aspects of the grant. Um, I worked on forming my mentoring team, choosing an institute to submit to, and really workshopping my aims with different members of my team and some outside um, people for feedback. And then from January to March of 2021, I wrote all the other sections, focusing my time heavily on the training plan, because as we said, it's a really, really important part of the application. And then I submitted the F31 for the April 8th deadline. Um, I received my score in June and a summary statement in July. Um, and I was planning to resubmit in December, um, but spoiler alert, I left out and was funded on my first submission, uh, which was awesome, and is uh, certainly the most exciting news I've ever received. Um, so that, that was pretty cool. Um, but enough about me. I think, you know, I think it would be really helpful to hear more about this whole process from the mentor perspective. Rachel, was there anything that surprised you about the process? Anything else you want to add or advice that you have specifically for faculty supporting these sort of initiatives? So uh, just a few things to add. Um, you know, I, I always think of grant writing as sort of like solving some sort of puzzle or cracking a code. And this was a type of, of application I had never done myself. And as I said, I hadn't had a, a trainee who had done one. So I just want to echo, you know, I. I really, I really wanted to like sort of get the inside story on how these work and figure it out in that way. And so I just really want to echo how important it is to get some examples. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know how you would go about starting off one of these if you've never done one before, if you didn't have a few examples just to see how they work. The other sort of inside track thing that we did, which I think was really important, was we had um, three people review Katie's. Uh, proposal. And two of them were people who had served on F31 study sections before. And I think that was absolutely critical because there's all this like inside stuff that you just don't know, like, you know, is the typical, where is the typical applicant as far as, you know, how many publications they've had and, you know, what looks good and what level of, of complexity or ambition should the research project have. So just like getting those inside track things, I think is really critical and key. Um, I don't know, I feel like we're going over time. I could keep talking, maybe I should save it for the, the Q&A session. But I, I do think that 
um, you know, for anyone, any faculty member who's considering this, um, you know, these, these do take a lot of time and you are inherently working with someone who just hasn't ever done an NIH submission. And, you know, for all of us, you know, we do these NIH submissions all the time and, and, you know, we have our own special ways that we like to have our bio sketches and it's just sort of, um, you know, something we know at this point, but you have to remember you're working with someone that it's truly their first rodeo. So there, there's a lot that, um, you know, there, there's just a lot that has to be figured out. Great, thanks you two. Um, so Melissa, Simone, you are up next. All right, um, well, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. I'm excited to talk about K99 ROOs. Um, so just to provide a little bit more of a background, the K99 ROO is two years of training, um, technically at the postdoctoral level at your um, current institution. And then um, it's followed by three years of uh, research funding and um, oftentimes um, awardees transition to a new university during um, when they move into the research phase because it is um, recognized as the transition to independence award. And so a little background about my specific award is that um, it focuses on identifying pop, uh, population specific risk and protective factors among queer women with regards to eating disorders um, using a mixed methods approach and community engaged research frameworks. And um, in addition to the research aims, similar to Katie, I do have a number of training aims that I'm to complete in the first two years of the award during the K99 phase. And um, that includes community engaged research frameworks, mixed methods, and health equity research frameworks. And as you could kind of see, those training aims are really aligned with the research aims that I described. Um, and I think it's really important when putting together any kind of training grant for the NIH that your research and training grants, uh, training aims are pretty integrated and kind of come together really nicely in a neat package. I decided to apply for a K99 specifically um, because I recognized that in order to do effective health equity research in queer and trans populations, I needed some additional training and specifically in community engaged research frameworks because it's really um, important to understand the lived experiences of the folks um, that I'm researching, especially when they've been historically excluded from research. So um, that made me kind of look towards the K mechanisms. However, in order to um, think about how I could launch my career, the K99 seems like a great fit because um, the, the past, I don't know, five to 10 years or maybe longer, the job market has become increasingly competitive. And I know that um, the K99 ROO is, um, kind of something that makes you stand out as a candidate when you're applying for jobs. And then you get to start your tenure track position with some research funds and you have a project ready to go. And I think it eases um, the transition both on the, um, the individual who's received the award because they kind of know what they're doing. They have the funds to do it. Um, you don't have to try to you know, identify what your next step at that specific university is going to be because you've, you've already applied for and received that award, but then also um, it demonstrates to the search committee that you have plans <laughs> that are upcoming and are not just going to rely on the work that you've done in the past. Um, so that is kind of my thoughts on what my main um, about my K99 and what the topic is and why I applied. Um, Nancy, should I kind of talk a little bit more about mentoring plans now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think that um, something that I realized, I previously applied for an F31 and kind of took those lessons, um, took the lessons I learned from that experience at my graduate institution to um, apply to the K99. So basically what I decided this time around was to work on building my mentorship team early on in the process. So I think um, sometimes it's really um, 
as trainees, we kind of feel like we need to have the perfect set of aims before we can either, you know, contact the program officer, contact potential mentors, um, and, and the like, and, and draft other sections of the grant. And I think that while having the perfect aims is important, you're going to, the, the structure of the aims is going to change as you work with your mentorship team and as you work with a PO or talk to a PO. So I think something that I took from my F31 experience and applied to the K99 with regards to mentorship was to think about what I was hoping to achieve with the K99 broadly and identifying areas of expertise that would be needed to achieve the, the broad aim of the study, which for me was to identify population-specific risk and protective factors among queer women. Um, and so I identified areas that were generally needed, then thought about what expertise I already have, and then worked to build a team that um, could help me fill gaps in the areas that I was hoping to receive training in and from, um, you know, separate from what I already have expertise in. Um, and I think another thing to note is that it, um, I found it to be really important to get my whole mentorship team together. Um, because all of the people, at least on my team, um, you know, are in different um, different departments, sometimes different uh, universities, and just to get everyone in the room to try to, you know, think about all of the questions and concerns that could be raised by my mentorship team in, in a group setting so we can kind of work through it together. It ends up saving a ton of time, but of course, everyone is incredibly busy. So if you are to do this, this demonstrates why it's really important to think and develop your mentorship team early because you might need to be booking, you know, your first meeting with your or uh, with your mentorship team three months out. So, just thinking um, ahead and getting the team together to make sure that you're putting in the strongest application possible. Um, and then the last thing about mentorship that I want to note is that um, I think something we don't talk about enough when we talk about these training awards is the need for letters of um, reference or letters of support from three to five people. And I think um, personally, when I submitted my F31, another mistake was that I didn't realize I needed these three to five letters of support in addition to my sponsors, co-sponsors, consultants, collaborators, et cetera. And I had expended all of my social capital on building this sponsorship team. And I was like, who's going to write these letters of support for me? So I think it's really important to know going into it that um, it's uh, you don't need to have someone in each of those spaces. You don't need to have a, you know, mentor, five co-mentors, a collaborator and a consultant when um, just thinking about your social capital and how you'd like to kind of utilize your social resources, um, just recognizing that not every single person who you view as a mentor needs to be a mentor on your application. Perhaps they can write a letter of support instead, and that way you have, you know, a complete application. Um, and then after talking about mentorship, what is our next question, Nancy? I'm sorry. Uh, training plan development. Okay, yes. So I kind of alluded to this earlier um, and the importance of putting, making your training plan kind of map on and coalesce with your research plan. And I think um, it's important not to underestimate the amount of time that it takes to put that together. I, I found that it took about the same amount of time as putting my research plan together. And um, for the K99, you only have two years of training. And I think that's important to keep in mind when you're collect, you know, when you're trying to reach out to folks to get um, some examples. K99 is less common than other K mechanisms, so you might get examples that are not exactly the K99, but a K01 or some other mechanism. And I think um, with that, you need to bear in mind that if you get a regular, a different K mechanism example, those folks have five years to complete those training aims. You have two. So I think it's important to recognize the time constraints and um, just make sure that you're getting the experiential training where you need it. For instance, 
Developing um, expertise in community engaged research requires experiential training, not just didactic training. So just thinking about what kinds of training you need to achieve each of your training aims and the, the timeline that you're expected to complete the training as it relates to the amount of time you need to expend on research activities as well. So trying to find that balance and in doing so, making sure that those training and research aims kind of intertwine with one another and nothing really stands out as like, why do you need training in this? It has nothing to do with your research that you're proposing. And then Melissa, do you wanna just say like a, just a few words before we transition to Horacio about like kind of what happened? Oh, yes, sure. Yeah, so I submitted um, my K99 uh, the first go round in uh, February of 2020. So right before the pandemic hit. And um, so that was um, great timing. And it was reviewed, I can't remember the specific timeline, but my first submission was discussed and I got a score of a 50. And it was so painful waiting with the score of a 50 to know what I, what, you know, what led to me being discussed, which indicates that, you know, you're in some upper percentage of, um, of proposals, but, um, but then getting a 50. So how were these going to be things that I could address? Was it going to be about me as a candidate? That month was incredibly painful waiting for the comments. <laughs> And I was really excited to know that a majority of my comments were about the scope of the study. So I had been a little bit too ambitious, a lot too ambitious. <laughs> and so I um, narrowed it down and really, um, really went step by step with, you know, with my mentorship team and having the summary statement and thinking about what I could do to address each and every single point of feedback to strengthen the study without kind of losing the whole purpose and um, aim of the study. And when I put my resubmission back in, I think it was no October, October, 2020, um, I um, was funded. So I got a 24 and I was really proud of the ability to kind of more than cut that, cut the score in, you know, more than slightly more than half. And um, it was, Great, but then you know there's that big waiting period that I also wasn't prepared for. So I think the the final meeting was May 25th, um, and I didn't receive final news until August 15th or August 16th. So it was a really long period between the um, the council meeting, so not the original review, but when it went to council, and then a final decision, which I think. Um, I've never made it to this phase of the grant review process. So I didn't know that the waiting period was gonna be that long. So I think just recognizing, it may be unique um, this year with COVID and specifically my grant is funded through the um, National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, which I know my program officer indicated they had an abundance of special program announcements, which kind of put them a bit behind their typical schedule. Um, but just recognizing that even though you can work to kind of get your submission in and your resubmission in a time, like in a way that's going to have a decision for you about your funding before, you know, your current position um, ends, that might, you might just also need to add a couple extra months to um, consider the, the waiting period. So for me, I know my, my postdoc prior ended like a month and a half before I received notice about um, the K99. So that was also another very terrifying waiting period, <laughs> but very grateful for the award <laughs> and the final, you know, the final end result. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Melissa. And Horacio, last but not least, let's hear about your K01. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Thanks again for the invitation to, to share. And, and uh, I, I'll, I'd echo all of the great advice and, and words of wisdom from Katie, Melissa, and, and Rachel. Um, and uh, first, I'll just say if anyone has any questions for me, I'm always happy to talk. I have a lot more to say than I can fit into the, the eight minutes or so. Um, and I, I'll start by saying, <laughs> to kind of a prelude to the kinds of things I'll say, I, I would consider myself a, a perseverant 
uh, optimist that sees the world of grants and, and academia through a thick lens of, of cynicism, uh, coupled with a, a healthy dose of, of humor. I think uh, what Rachel described is, is putting together pieces of a puzzle. I, I look at as putting together a, a fairy tale and trying to, to find the balance between the fairy tale and what you can actually uh, fit into reality. So, I'll, I'll, and, and then the other, so that I, I call that sort of the fairy tale phenomenon. The other, uh, the other thing that most of my piece of advice fall under is I guess what I'll call the Goldilocks phenomenon where most of the comments you're gonna get from reviewers um, and it could be on the same thing, but from different reviewers, it's one person says it's too warm and the other one says it's too cold. So I'll come back to that. And I think most of my advice can fall under those two uh, sort of cynical categories of advice. But um, so I, I promised to hit all the points. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. So I, I officially, so I, I accepted and I'm, first I'm really excited to be here. I, uh, my first day, official day on the job was June 30th. Uh, I applied for the job like in June of 2020, right after I submitted my K in May of 2020. Um, I think I accepted the job in November and then had a several months to prepare for the move. But so I, I have a, a K01. Um, something that's a bit different from probably many people in the audience is I'm, I'm a, a physician. Um, I came from a medical school from a division of pediatric infectious diseases. So to sort of answer the question of like, why, why a K? Um, for me, a K was, it was never really a question. It was just what you do in sort of, a, it's sort of an institutional cultural difference, maybe uh, to some degree in, in schools of medicine. So if you're going to do the physician scientist track as a faculty member, as opposed to a more sort of clinician educator role, um, you, uh, it's just the norm that you, you go for a, a K award. And I would say most medical schools, um, in terms of funding for junior faculty, fall under one of two camps. One is you get like a nice assistant professor position. They give you a few years to say, hey, come on over. Like, we'll take care of you. We'll give you time to apply for your K. Um, and the other camp is more like, hey, you're welcome to stay here after your fellowship training, um, but you pretty much need to fund yourself. Um, and so that's kind of where my institution, University of Washington, fell under. And, and so culturally in medicine, it's very common. By the time people have gone through college, med school, residency, fellowship, people don't really want to move again. So it's very common for people to stay at their same institution. And, and oftentimes to make that happen, you're scrambling to put together a K award um, by the end of your fellowship to try to get, get the funding you need to get the, the full assistant professor position. So for me, um, my K, I guess let me tell you a little bit about my, my K01. So I do decision analysis research, um, broadly speaking, and my, my, my project uh, focuses on, on a, sort of an emerging set of methods called value of information analysis, which in layman's terms, you're, rather than looking at the cost effectiveness of interventions, you're, um, you're looking at sort of the cost effectiveness of investing in, in certain research projects. Um, and my, my research focuses on HIV in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I'm looking at sort of the value of collecting more information on certain areas around uh, rolling out a, a new drug called dalutegravir to treat HIV. So it's, it's a very computationally oriented thing. So in terms of, um, uh, so whether or not to apply for a K was never really a question. In terms of which one to apply for, most physicians either apply for a K23 or a K08. K23 requires human subjects, which I didn't, my research didn't involve. K08s are kind of for everything else, but typically more lab oriented. But in my instance, uh, applying to uh, NIAID, they had a specific mechanism, their K01 was specifically oriented to the kind of research I do. And they kind of had this unofficial rule that even if you're a physician, you have to apply for the K01. And they said, we can't tell you with certainty, it's not written down, but if you apply for a K08, we might not even read your application. So I said, okay, so I'm applying for a K01. Um, K99s and the RO, uh, that mech the, the mechanism Melissa went for um, are just less common in, in medicine. So that's just, that was kind of just didn't go for it. It's, most places want you to have like a, this five year um, length period of time for funding. So, um, so I applied, I applied in May of uh, 2020. Um, I, I got it on the first try, but it was a, a painful process. 
Um, I so I applied in May. I I got my score in August. I got a twenty. And NIAD usually funds things below eighteen or below, but in recent years they were a little nicer. And the prior year it was twenty, but I had to wait forever. NIAD was the last institute in the whole NIH probably to set up a pay line for for K awards. They had set it for everything else except for their K awards. So I didn't find out till April um, that that uh, their pay line was twenty, and then I had to wait a few more months to to find out that it got funded. Um, normally, if I if I hadn't known I was coming here, um, I probably would have reapplied again in January. And by the way, the the dates I'm saying are different because it's HIV, which is the only disease that's different from all the other ones. Um, so so anyways, that, that was a little bit why I applied for a, a K. Um, in terms of the, the mentorship, so at the time I was applying from my old institution. So as a, as a primary mentor, I had someone from the biostats department who she happened to be the chair of the biostats department and had expertise in, in Bayesian statistics and value of information analysis, which was relevant to what I was doing. The, the reality is the main person who was really going to provide most of my mentorship was someone at this institution in HPM named Eva Enns, who I had known for a long time and been working with her. And um, um, so I guess uh, I can delve into some specifics. So some, some things to consider when you're putting together a mentorship team, there's a bunch of boxes you kind of want to check off, right? There's, you want, you want the content expertise to be covered. So like, HIV content, for example. Um, and then you want the methods expertise to be covered. You also want people who, at least on paper, look really successful. They have lots of publications, they have lots of grants, and they can mentor you in you know, becoming as successful as they are. Um, but then also the, the reality is like you want people that you enjoy working with and, and that are actually going to help you. And so kind of, um, and, and so this fairy tale thing, this wasn't something I made up. It's some wisdom that was passed on to me from uh, another, from a mentor a long time ago is like, you're, you're, you're writing this fairy tale and you, you wanna put in all the pieces that they're looking to hear, um, but then you also have to keep in mind, um, you know, that it's actually meeting your, what you need. And um, it's hard to, as, as you guys probably figured out, like you can't find everything you need in one mentor. And sometimes you can't find everything you need in three mentors. Um, there, you know, you might have what I found is I, um, people would have like the, the methods expertise, but not the, maybe not the content expertise. Um, but I, I sort of just, I just kind of went for it, um, um, to kind of backtrack a little bit on my path. This wasn't my first rodeo, so to speak. I had applied, uh, at the end of residency, I applied for a, a, a nationally competitive K-12 through NICHD. So most K-12s are institutional. This one, they pick like the top six to eight people who um, were pediatric subspecialists. Um, so I got, I got two years of that. And then I had to, you had to apply for like a third year. So I had already written basically with that two sort of K equivalents. Also later in May of 2018, I applied for a different a K01, um, similar area of research, but different, different topic. I applied, um, I got a 33 and then decided not to, the program officer was optimistic that I could uh, um, get it on the next try, but I had some mentorship problems and I just, I dropped it and it took me a couple of years to regroup. So it's really important. It's really important to, uh, to have a, a solid mentorship team in, in all aspects. Um, the, the, uh, the training, so the, the training component kind of goes, everything goes together, right? So it's a career, it's a career development grant. So they're expecting you to not just do more of the same. You want to provide, you want to um, propose that you're going to, like, I've, I've gained expertise already in X, Y, and Z. For me, it was like infectious disease modeling, cost effectiveness analysis, and something else. And now I'm going to gain more expertise in value of information analysis and, um, and uh, Bayesian statistics. And so your training is going to be geared towards accomplishing that. And um, you're, so I, I try to keep the number of like actual courses like at a university low 
and try to get as many things as I could at like short courses at conferences and like the Society for Medical Decision Making. Um, a common thing that'll happen is, you know, well, reviewers are gonna say you have too much coursework or you don't have enough coursework. I would say most of the time people will say you have too much coursework because you get really, you just wanna like please the reviewers and you propose too much. Um, so, and, and you want, you want uh, to make it clear that a lot of the training is going to come directly from your mentor, and it's going to couple the the the, the courses that you that you take. Um, what else? Uh, what else do I want to say? But yeah, in terms of this like Goldilocks thing, so so don't be discouraged. Like you'll see some people say, "Oh, you have you don't have enough papers, um, so you're not going to get it." Oh, now you have too many papers. You don't need a K. You should just go for an R. Or when, with the mentors, it'll be like, um, oh, you've worked with this mentor for too long. Or it'll be like, oh, you've got this new mentor to do this new thing, but you haven't worked with them long enough. You don't have any papers with them. So just know that like, you can't please everyone and you just have to know how to work the system. Um, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. What else? Um, yeah, uh, then, you know, transferring your application. I had to transfer my application before I got the award, which is its own thing. And Char and Nita were amazing. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll uh, stop. I have, I have lots more. If you, anyone wants to stop, I have lots more to share. <laughs> I know. It's, I mean, this is great. Everybody is sharing so much wisdom. And I love the Goldilocks uh, piece. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to steal that from you. I know. Um, so Shar, do you want to take like a, just a minute or two to kind of like, um, cause just in the interest of time to have a few questions, time for a few questions at the end, your, some of your best tips and tricks. Oh, sure. Thanks, Nancy. Um, and thank you for the kind words earlier, Ruby. <laughs> um, some of the tips and tricks to making the process go smoothly um, from working with the research support services team um, perspective is really, um, you know, read through the application instructions and your program announcement. Those are your two big key things that you're going to you're going to be writing off of. So make sure you're um, hitting those high points that are listed in the instructions and your program announcement. Um, for EPI CH um, um, applicants, um, we have provided checklists. We've kind of gone through some of those application instructions with a fine tooth comb as well. And we've put together um, checklists to help you through that process. So follow that checklist and um, adhere to any of the internal deadlines that we may set because we're working on uh, many different um, applications throughout the course of a grant deadline. Um, but also the biggest thing, you know, you know, we provide all this information and things like that, but, you know, communicate with us along the way. That's a big key piece. You know, if you're falling behind, if you don't think you're going to get the application in this round, you know, just stay in communication with the team because um, we are here to support you and, and we understand things come up um, in your lives as well. So if you have to delay the application, you know, let us know as well. Um, and also, um, for those folks who don't know, um, we have what's called the grant um, toolkit, and we have a specific tab um, that we are developing for career development. There is a lot of um, information and resources on that tab of the toolkit. Um, and a lot of it also has to do with like career timelines of when you need to apply for things. You know, we've linked to a lot of NIH resources as well um, there. Now, in terms of budgeting, because, you know, I work with every one of you on a budget. Um, so Melissa and Horacio know this. <laughs> um, you know, um, for budgets for F series applications, um, like Katie submitted. Um, a lot of the budget for those F-series applications are already kind of preset by NIH with formulas, um, except the tuition and fees category. Um, and that's where you're going to take most of your coursework. And um, so you're proposing your tuition and fees category at 100% level. But once the award comes in, NIH is going to apply a formula that they have, and you're going to be funded for 60% of your tuition and fees category. Um, so 
you know, I try to make people aware of that right away when we're working on these F applications. And also NIH has just recently announced, um, well, about a year ago, they announced that for F series applications, an additional $2,500 can be budgeted for childcare allowances um, if that is something that the applicant needs. They have now um, gone into phase two of that. And um, so now those are applied to your T32 um, candidates as well on, train, on institutional training grants. For the K-series grants, in particular for K99 ROO is in the K01 that um, we worked with, each NIH institute has its own specific policies, you know, at what kind of level the candidate can be budgeted for. Is there a salary cap? Um, how much can you get for your research support costs? So communicate that early on to the team um, when budgeting, which institute you're going to su submit to, um, because we can look up all of those requirements as well. Um, and then I guess the, the one thing too that I just want to make everybody aware of, you know, as you're writing your mentoring plans and your career plans, you know, there's some other, um, writing a grant is a big picture and there's some other institutional requirements that have to be done even before you can submit the grant through your sponsored projects office at any institution, you know, like um, your compliance trainings, um, your PI trainings, um, getting an ERA Commons ID, ORCID IDs, and just know that once you're going to submit a grant and you get to the process where you're going to work with our team, I'll be reaching out to you as an individual with some of these other institutional requirements to help that process. So when the grant gets submitted to our sponsor project office, it just goes through the system. And there isn't a hiccup or hang up anywhere. Um, that's just, so I just wanted to make you aware that, you know, there's this piece of institutional stuff, this piece of you writing your grant, <laughs> and this piece of budgeting. <laughs> um, so we try to get all three of those pieces um, cohesively done at the same time. So awesome. uh, thank you, Shar. Yeah. Um, yeah. What? So we are we are like at the end. Dr. Whittem has something important that she has wanted to express that she didn't get to say. So we will let Dr. Whittem have the last word and then maybe Ruby, Ruby too. And then also I know that I'm the panelists would be happy to answer any questions that we kind of ran out of time for. But um, anyway, Dr. Whittem. Thank you, Nancy. I'm sorry. This is something I hope to answer in the Q&A, but it didn't fit into your questions. And sorry, we're running short on time. I just, it ties into what Shar said. I just want to emphasize the piece of institutional commitment on the back end with regard to F31. So, you know, in F31, it is a lot of work to put one of those together, maybe on the same scale as putting together an R01 for a pretty small amount of money. And I think a real key to being successful is being in a unit that has decided that we want F31s in our unit. So, you know, historically, EPI has, we haven't had F31s. That's just not how we funded students. I think a key to success is deciding that this is something that we want and we value. And I think back to my first faculty position when I was um, in the medical school and at the VA and I got a VAK award. And one of the things that was really critical to my success there, my unit at the VA hadn't had a K award in years. And this was something I needed to get. I absolutely needed to get or I wouldn't have been successful there. But also my unit needed me to get it because their center funding was dependent on, on holding K awards in their center. So they were going up for center renewal and they needed K awards too. They needed someone to get a K. And they did some things that were really critical in my, for my success. For instance, they hadn't had one in years. One of the investigators got herself onto a case study section so we could know how they worked. My letters of support were all written by the people who actually wrote them. I know people who had to write their own letters of support for Ks, but you know the, my, my colleagues there wrote their own letters for me. They were just very committed to, to my success because it was also tied into their success. So I just wanna say that, that I think that there is a piece of decision that we have to make for some of these awards, especially those that don't bring in a ton of dollars about whether we feel committed to truly supporting that kind of award here. Uh, 
I don't know if there's time or I'm happy to stay over. There were a couple of questions in the in the chat. Um, um, so so one was um, about. Okay. Oh yeah, go ahead. Asking, you mind, I, I'll just um, give permission for anyone who has to leave to leave, and then um, as many of the panelists who can stay on, we'd love to have you on. In addition. Let's continue this. Let's continue it in the spring semester um, seminar series. Um, and we'll focus on discussion in the, in the upcoming one. But thank you so much. What a wonderful day to celebrate all of your awards and to give us hope for um, future awards in the, in the future. So thank you, each, one, each and every one of the panelists. Horacio. Yeah, so um, someone asked about um, institutional support for a K-01. So yeah, it's it's definitely required. I mean, I think all, all these applications, there's a there's a section called um, institutional letter of support, which is a, a one page letter. And so, you know, it, it, it's going to say nice things about you and how committed they are to you. Really, like what what they're sort of, I don't know where this is written in the guidelines, but essentially what what is supposed to happen is the in in some language the institution is supposed to communicate that we want this person regardless of um, whether or not they get this funding. Um, that's what's supposed to happen. The way it worked at my institution and a lot of medical schools is it's there's it's not they there's crafty language that can be used to satisfy NIH, but it's not exactly the case. Um, so like at my old institution, you couldn't actually, you could get, um, you might get as far as acting assistant professor without a K, but you, you can't get the assistant professor until you have the K. And so there was certain language that people figured out would, would work. Um, but, but yeah, so you, you have to kind of know the, the system to, to meet that, that guarantee, that sort of criteria. Horacio, so I can build on that because I'm the one writing those letters and it's, um, I'm being very careful in what I write. Um, and those are decisions that we're, we're kind of grappling with and making now because we, we often do, like we don't, we don't build our faculty in this way. You know, we didn't select you obviously because you might have a K, we just thought you were amazing. And we, that's how we build our faculty. And we can't offer financial support. So I write this letter and every time I cringe a little and I interpret it as saying we are supportive of this person doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna financially be supportive of them, but I'm I'm you know I'm 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 always thinking about it. So that's why we're not we're kind of trying out this process and Nancy and I are in touch a lot and kind of figuring out um, how we make this happen, you know, without, in, in a way that supports people, but also we're following what the guidelines that we need to be following. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think, I think a lot of, I think a lot of chairs are in the same boat yeah. and it's just the way things work, but it's just the, the rules are written in a way that's not maybe super realistic. <laughs> I just want to say that I, I wrote it in my chat, but I just want to say that it's just so uplifting to hear all of you speak. And I know how much work goes into these grants by you and your teams and the staff. And it's just really, really, really exciting. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Well, we still have some of our panelists. Does anybody have any other questions? There, there was another question about, um, that I think Melissa answered in the chat about transitioning to a new institution. Um, I think that someone asked to me. So um, I think as far as, as far as Ks are concerned, I, I can speak to like K-1s. Um, once, like once you have the K, um, there's, <laughs> you have a, a great degree of freedom and leniency in kind of um, changing to some degree what you do and 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 people you have to write progress reports but my understanding is like they don't hold you to every fine detail of what you said you were going to do it's sort of understood that oftentimes at least where, where the world I come from in medical school sometimes people get their k and then they might go to another institution and so it's just kind of understood that um you're going to have to probably change a mentorship team a bit. 
Um, and there's there's a process where you have to like you're you want to be you want to be very friendly with your program officer I think in general but also in this case like if they're supportive of you and you can kind of explain to your program officer how your new plan at this new institution is going to meet the goals of of what you had originally said then I think it's it's my understanding it's basically the program officer that kind of gives the blessing that like yeah if you're going to the new new institution you're good and it doesn't have to go back to like some kind of review committee. Um, the the paperwork is a whole nother thing, but that's kind of <laughs> the highlights. Um, one of the things I was just going to mention is, you know, this we have this panel has underscored like all the effort and so, so forth that has to go into these. And Rachel pointed out some important things about kind of, we have to kind of decide that we want to do, do this, that it's a priority. And um, one of the things I think we're trying to, to do is try to have, like try to provide as much support and guidance. And like, the more we do, I think the more, the easier it will be because there's more, um, examples out there and experience so we kind of that 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 added time that comes with the ambiguity do we do this do we do that like we're trying to kind of take that away and katie i don't know if you just want to talk a little bit about what we're um trying to do for the f31 specifically well some sure. folks might be um, so um submitting the f31 was was super hard um it was it was a major challenge and it, it took a lot of time and the hard part weren't necessarily like the actual content of of the application like actually figuring out my goals you know was a challenge but but not like a massive barrier actually writing doing the science part of things wasn't a huge barrier um but what was like incredibly hard was just like understanding the process and understanding the expectations for each of this these sections um so I don't think it should have to be that hard. Um, so I, Nancy and I are trying to work together to try to demystify the process for students a little bit um, and develop some resources that make those expectations a little clearer about um, what goes in each section and what um, uh, tips for each section and how to integrate it all together and sort of all the things that sort of gave me and other students who have applied for F31s like pause like during the application where we're like, I don't really know how, what this means or I don't really know what to do. We're trying to like target those difficult points and, and make those, those decision points easier for people by just like providing more information and also just like people who can answer those sort of questions. Um, we're also hopefully uh, developing like a grant support group for doctoral students that will hopefully open up to postdocs as well uh, to focus on uh, student-led grants. So uh, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have some exciting stuff coming soon. Make it a little bit easier for people. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I don't know if there are any last questions or I don't know, Ruby, I don't know how you end these. <laughs> <laughs> To say thank you <laughs> for your time and Nancy thank you so much for your leadership and getting this together but really it, it was very clear that a, a lot of people want to be engaged in these processes and so I'd love to have either the entire panel back if you have time or however the research committee envisions um, a, a spring semester seminar on a related topic so thank you so very much awesome. thanks everybody thanks panelists thank, thank you. you congratulations all have a nice weekend, everyone.